Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me in the Gospel of John to John chapter 5. We continue our series that we're calling Hope Has a Name. But here in this Christmas season when we talk about the, the hope of the season, right, and this perpetual hope and hoping that we can end the year well and hoping that we just get to the next year, all of this hope, hope has a name. Hope is Jesus. And so this morning we continue our series, Hope Has a Name, John chapter 5. Now, um, broken things, I don't keep them. They're, they clutter the space. If it's broken, fix it or throw it out, right? One way or the other, no sense in, in holding on to it if it is broken. Now, my dad, on the other hand, my dad keeps everything. Um, he keeps broken things, lamps, chairs, lawnmowers. Uh, my dad, it, in the old days, you put your, they put the you know, stuff out, bulk item out by the, the street, and, uh, and it'd actually get picked up. Uh, and so my dad would ride around, and he would see a lawnmower uh, that someone had sat out on the street, and guess what he would do with it? He would go home, get his truck, and drive back over there and pick it up. And so we had like this parking lot of broken down lawnmowers in the garage and, and I was like, Dad, why, why, like somebody threw it out on purpose. And he's like, oh, I can fix it. You never know. And so sure enough, he just start mixing and matching. And so he kept all of these broken things because he knew either, he either knew how to restore them or to fix them, or at least he was willing to spend the energy trying. Uh, I did not inherit that trait from my father. Now, to some degree, we all know what it's like to be broken. We've experienced a broken heart. For some of us, the hurt goes beyond a broken heart to the point uh, that we have trouble functioning well in relationships and in social settings because of the brokenness in our lives. Because of life's circumstances, we might say that that person is a broken person, right? I would even say that the biggest disease today is the feeling of being forgotten, unwanted, or just passed by. Jesus loves broken people. As a matter of fact, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Jesus said that he came to heal the brokenhearted. There in Luke 4, 18, the word brokenhearted speaks of rubbing against something. The word is used for kindling a fire where you rub two sticks together so violently that you start a fire. Brokenhearted literally means to be crushed or to be broken to pieces. And that's because life rubs so hard against our lives sometimes that we can become brokenhearted. We can become crushed by our circumstances. Now here's the buzzword that I believe that you and I use for life circumstances that are rubbing against us. It's the word busy. You say, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. Boy, I'm just, I'm just so busy. We're busy. It used to be that we would say, man, this is really just a, a busy time of the year. I don't know about you, but for me, I can't seem to find a time of the year that's not busy anymore, right? Uh, I thought that when our children got older that somehow I would redeem back some of that time. Uh, Y'all all forgot to tell me that that's a lie and that there's no such thing as getting the time back even as they get older and begin to move out of the house. And so for those of you with little ones, that won't happen to you. But we say, I'm busy. I'm just, I'm just so busy. I've got so many things, right? So many things going on. So much that I've got to do. It's all that stuff that's rubbing against us. And the result is that we become tired. We're trying, but we just can't seem to get caught up, let alone get ahead. And so we become tired. We become crushed. We become brokenhearted. And then we ask, is there any hope in my situation? Is there any use in me even continuing to try? And so you survey your life, and this is what you say. It wasn't supposed to be this way. I had hoped that things would be different. And so we ask, does God have any answers? Does God have any comfort? Is there any hope for my life? Pick up with me in John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Let's read our text together. It says, after this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And by the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there's a pool called Bethesda in, 
in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. Within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. Get up, Jesus told him. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. Now, that day was the Sabbath, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, This is the Sabbath. The the law prohibits you from picking up your mat. And he replied, The man who made me well told me, Pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you to pick up your mat and walk, they asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And after this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See you are well, do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. And the man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And therefore the Jews began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are God and you are good. And this morning, God, we uh, come before you. God, help us to surrender our lives to you and to your truth today. Father, help us to see you, to know you, to respond to you in a surrendered faith. Father, we testify in our hearts and even if we had time with our words that many of us are carrying burdens and we are broken or are breaking down in a lot of ways. And so, Lord, this morning, would you help us to be encountered by and to encounter your son, Jesus the giver, the author, and the perfecter of our faith and our hope. For it's in his name that we pray, amen. Now, you've probably heard the statement. Let me survey this. Anybody ever heard the statement, uh, God helps those who help themselves? Ever heard that, right? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay. All right, appreciate the group participation there. Uh, some of you probably said that, and when I said that, you're probably thinking, you're right. that's right, God helps those who help themselves. It's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the way. Matter of fact, it is about as uh, anti-contrary Bible as you can get. Matter of fact, God who helps those who help themselves it was actually, do you know who said that? Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was, is, is credited with having said that. Not God, not Jesus, not any of the apostles. Okay? So here's the big idea out of the text. God helps those who can't help themselves. That's the truth. Right, the truth is that God helps those who can't help themselves. And so this morning, I want us to see uh, really two overarching uh, thematic statements out of this text that help us to understand who we are in relation to God and what God has done for us in Jesus and how we then should respond to him out of our brokenness. So the first of these themes is this. People can get broken. People can get broken. We say around here at Cross Point that life it's complicated. Life can get real complicated, and sometimes it's more complicated than at other times. And so life has a way of rubbing against us, right, and creating a brokenness. And so people can get broken. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 14 says, A person's spirit can endure sickness, but who can survive a broken spirit? Now, you can't always pick out the broken person. Matter of fact, I I heard this said to me years ago, and I I say it quite a bit. I I don't know where I got it from. It's not original to me. Uh, Matter of fact, there's nothing really new under the sun, but here it is. You don't really know someone until you've lived with them or worked with them. And so you can't always pick out the broken person because we do a real good job of covering it up on the outside with, with, with cosmetics, with activities, with stuff, right? And so you can't always pick it up. But here in this text in John chapter 5, we meet a man who is described as having been sick or having been ill for 38 years. And so life's experiences and our choices can leave us broken. I want us to see the interaction between Jesus and this broken man this morning. First of all, people can get broken by our circumstances. Now, whether this man had been 
uh, lame, had been broken from birth, or it was an onset condition of something that happened later in his life, the reality is that the text tells us that he had been broken for 38 years, for almost four decades. He didn't choose it, right? I, I don't know anybody that wakes up and says, you know, today be a good day for me to become paralyzed. Had it been since his birth, maybe it had caused him to miss out on life. You think about all of the things that a child would have missed out on by not being able to run and to play and to enjoy, and all of the things that a young adult and now into his adulthood. If it was the result of an accident or something that maybe had happened in his adult life, maybe it had caused him to miss out on relationships. But one thing that we know is that chronic illness isolates and creates a sense of loneliness. The Bible says here that the man was at the, the pool at Bethesda, and that the, he was there, and, and there would have been hundreds, if not literally multiplied hundreds of other sick persons there. Matter of fact, the text tells us, that when, verse 3, within these lay a large number of disabled, blind and lame and paralyzed. And so though he had been surrounded by hundreds of people, this feeling and this sense of isolation and loneliness had crept into his life. And so sometimes we're broken by our circumstances. Sometimes we're broken by other people. Sometimes we're broken by some of those that are the closest to us, that cause us the most amount of grief and the most amount of heartache. Another one of those parenting things that some of you forgot to tell my wife and I about is that as they get into the teenage years, you go to bed and just have to hold some hurt in your heart between you and Jesus. And so sometimes we're broken by people. Verse 3 says that it, there was a great multitude of sick people. Now in this day and in this time, sick people would have wound up in one of two places. They would have either wound up as a beggar by the city gate, right? And we see other places in, in the scriptures where there are beggars who are at the city gates you know, asking for, for alms, asking for money. So that's one place that they would have wound up. And another place is that they would wind up con con congregating with other sick people. We see this even in our culture, right? That, that those in certain conditions wind up generally in a place together, right? And so they become situated there. And so it's a very similar context here. I, I want to give you a, a little bit better picture. And the pictures that I'm going to uh, use on the, the screen here, um, obviously these, are not, these were not snapshots from the first century. These are renderings, you know, after archaeological digging and, and a lot of studying. These are uh, renderings of what it most likely would have looked like. So here's the, the Temple Mount. We're on the north side of the city. We're on the north side of, of the land. And so you'll notice down here in the right, it, sa right, it says the sheep pool. And so the sheep, that the lambs that would have been brought for the sacrifices would have been brought in through that gate and washed and cleansed and taken right out. And if you look up in the kind of mid-right corner, you'll see a little arched door. It's the sheep door. It's where the sheep would have been taken in then to be sacrificed at the temple. If we can go back one slide just a moment, guys. And so you'll see the Temple Mount here, and you'll see the pools of Bethesda in the far right corner there, outlined with the red tops. And so I want you to see geographically that the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 that at this time a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and by the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool called Bethesda, and within these lay a large number of the disabled, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And so hold this in your mind, right, so that you can see that where these sick people are, where this lame man is at, at the pool of Bethesda, they would have brought the sheep by and he would have been right close by, right? So now move to the next slide if we would. And so you can get a little bit idea of what this would have been. So you can see the pools. These would have been the result of natural springs that popped up coming up under the ground there. And so there is that sheep gate, that uh, door that I, that, she, the sheep door that I mentioned going into the temple area. And so this 
lame man would have been around one of these two pools, having been carried there by someone, right? He could not walk. He was paralyzed. So he had begged his way to this place because the, the idea was the old story went this way, that when the water was stirred in the morning, that the first one in would be healed. And so he had been brought here to this place, had begged his way there, and is now not able to get in the water and still begging somebody to get there. But I want you to think this now. Here he would have been. Here would have all of these people have been. And you can imagine that there would have, this would not have been like a party, right? Uh, with this many sick people in these kind of conditions, there would have been moaning, there would have been crying out, there would have been mental illness that would have led to a lot of talking out. You can just kind of picture the scene that this guy's in. But right to his left is the Temple Mount, and there was a festival in town, right? There was a feast, there was a festival going on, there was a celebration at the temple, and so the sheep would have been brought by. So from where he was at, he could hear the bleeding of the sheep, he could hear the sacrifice of the animals, and he could hear the celebration at the temple. He was that close, yet an eternity away. Now, on a normal day, there would have been a few hundred people at this pool. But as the text tells us, it was a feast week, so there's likely thousands, right? Because, listen, when you are beggar poor, where do you go? You go to where you know there's people because you need people to beg from, right? So they would have moved into this area by the droves. Now, why were they there? Well, they were hoping to get into the water after what they thought what they would say the angel stirred the water. This idea that I just mentioned that when the water was stirred, it was stirred by an angel, and the first to get in the water after it was stirred would be healed. Now, somebody will say, well, what caused this stirring? Have you ever been to a spring before? Just natural fed from underneath the ground? There's a, you'll see it, the bubbles and the stirring up, right? It was just caused because the water, the water was filtering into there. But there was such a desire, there was such a hope that something would improve their situation. There was a, there was a hope that there was something that they could do that would, that would change their condition that they had kind of concocted this idea in their mind. You and I do the same thing. That's why when we hear statements like God uh, helps those who help themselves, we go, yeah, that sounds good. I like that. I think I'll adopt that. And so in our desire and our hope for something to improve our condition, we'll buy into anything. Broken people feel shelved and isolated. I mean, the lame man said to Jesus, I have no one to help me into the pool. I'm all by myself. I'm surrounded by hundreds, maybe thousands here this week. And he said, but I have no one to help me. So sometimes we're broken by people. Sometimes, though, we're broken by time. The text tells us in verse 5 that there was a man who had been disabled for 38 years, for nearly four decades. This is a man on whom time had taken its toll. And so people will say things like this, well, time heals all wounds. Not necessarily. We're hoping that time will help. We're hoping that the further we get away from a situation, the further we get away from an experience, the longer that there is some time and distance between us and who or what or where broke us and hurt us, we hope that that will bring some healing. But that is not always the case. Matter of fact, hear me on this, dear friend. If we do not use time in the best way, then time can actually cause more wounds than it does healing. The daily pressure and the excruciating sense of loss when things don't get better over time crushes the human heart. I mean, think about it. 38 years this man had begged. 38 years he had been sick. 38 years he had been lame and paralyzed. Every morning, waking and thinking, could today be the day? Might today be the day that there will be someone who will help put me in the water? 
I mean, might today be the day that I can somehow muster up enough physical strength into my arms to tip myself over in the water faster than anyone else? Might today be it, and the day comes, and the opportunity passes. I mean, after 38 years, do you have a whole lot of hope left? After 38 years, after time, I really believe the man had settled and resigned that this is my lot in life. This is all that it'll ever be. Sometimes we're crushed by the enemies of hope. Discouragement. Exhaustion from the physical and in the emotional effort. Maybe in a marriage or in a relationship or in a friendship you have said, I've tried. I give up. I've, I've tried everything I can. I give up. I quit. There's a lack of human help that can lead to discouragement. Listen to me, dear friend. Our enemy, the devil, desires to isolate you away from other people so that he can cause you to doubt and discourage and despair. So hear me. The last thing you need to do, the last thing that you can afford to do is to withdraw from people. Now obviously we believe that the local church is the best place to find friendship and relationship and encouragement in relationship with others. And so if you are not in a small group that we call a community group, we will be launching new groups in January. So right after the first year, an opportunity, right? So you're sensing. Listen, don't get sucked away. For those of you that are in a community group, don't you dial out of it. You'll find yourself isolated. Don't pull even out of church if you're not in a community group yet. <laughs> don't you pull out of, 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 of being faithful and engaging in the fellowship and the worship and the life of church. There is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. Those people get eaten up by the lone wolves of the world. And brokenness. People can get broken, and our brokenness then is expressed by depression and isolation, which leads to anger and substance abuse and self-harm. I really believe that every issue is a spiritual issue, and you cannot meet a spiritual need with a physical substitute. And so on one hand here in the text, we see this, this understanding that people can be broken. And you think, preacher, like, this is Christmas season. That's about as depressing as you can be. All right, now let us lift our eyes to the one who is our hope. Jesus loves broken people. Jesus came for the broken, right? He said, I've not come for those that are well, but for those that are sick. <laughs> Jesus heals the man in John chapter 5. Notice now, not in response to the man's faith. Matter of fact, the man, the lame man here never refers to Jesus as anything other as what? Sir or the man, right? Jesus said, do you want to get well? He said, sir, I don't have anybody to help me to get in the, in, in the water. After he was healed, the religious leader said, who told you that you were healed and to take your mat and walk? He goes, the man that healed me. I don't even know his name, Right? And so Jesus heals the man, not in response to faith, but rather just out of the sheer mercy of God. And so we see that Jesus engages, he loves this man with compassion. Loving the broken begins with how we see the broken. Matthew chapter 9 tells us that Jesus saw the people as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus moves toward brokenness. Jesus moves toward the hurting. As a matter of fact, when all else is moving away from a situation, Jesus is moving into it. And I really think that ought to be a model for God's people and for the church. 
When we know that there is someone who is struggling, when we know that there is someone who is dealing with a difficulty, here's how God's people should respond. When everybody else is walking away because they don't understand or they don't want to be associated with, God's people ought to be walking into those situations with the mercy and the compassion of Jesus. Because but for the grace of God, there go we. You say, well, what would somebody think about me? It doesn't matter what they would think about us. That person who is in need, right? Listen. When somebody is struggling, when somebody has a difficulty, we'll sort the details out later, but let's make certain that we surround them and their family and the community with hope and help so that as we sort out the details, we help them walk in truth and we help them walk in repentance and we help them walk in surrendered faith. Jesus moves toward brokenness and he moves with compassion. Compassion is... Another way of just saying it, mercy in action, right? Uh, compassion is not saying bless your heart. Compassion is taking the resources and the energy and the time that you have and applying them to the very situation where there is a need. So Jesus deals with this man in compassion. I want you to know this Jesus deals with this man in honesty. He deals with the man in honesty. Now, one of the dangers, one of the pitfalls, I believe, over the last couple of years, well, one of the strengths is that we have come to, to acknowledge that, uh, that people are broken, right? And there's been a, a good emphasis on mental health and a lot of other things. But here, here's where I get concerned uh, in ministry life and church life. We know that behind all of that is a spiritual need of a right relationship with God through Jesus. So let us not stop at the surface. Let us meet that need, but let us, as we learned last week in the text following Jesus' example, is let us meet that need, but let us always move to the gospel. And so this man, Jesus spoke honestly with him. Look in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized he'd already been there a long time, he said to the man, do you want to get well? I mean, what kind of question is that, Jesus? <laughs> this man is at the healing pool. This man is there. Why else would he be there? Jesus says to the man, do you, do you even want to get well? You see, here's the thing. After 38 years, if you're not careful, and it wouldn't even take 38 years, you will become so identified in your victim status that you won't really want things to change because you have settled and acclimated to your new normal. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? Now, the man had been in this condition so long that a change in his condition would require a change in his responsibilities. Think about it now. This is a man who for 38 years had been dependent on everyone else to do anything for him. And Jesus says, do you even want to get well, right? Or do, you, do you want your circumstances to change? Do you want to be well? Because if you do, it, it can happen and it's, it, life's going to be different. There's some responsibility you're going to have to take. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, do you really want a different life? This man's identity, his identity was poor me. Sir, I, I don't have anyone to help me. Poor me. After 38 years, this man's condition had become his way of life. Think about it. He was not known by his name. We don't know the man's name, do we? Nowhere in the text. What do we know this man as? The lame man. The paralyzed man. I, I this week, have thought about the multitude of songs 
Uh, some of you will not, don't, do not know this. I, I grew up and I cut my teeth on four-part Southern Gospel quartet music. Do you have any idea how many Southern Gospel songs there are about the lame man laying by the pool of Bethesda? That's what he was known as. The lame man by the pool. Hear, hear me, dear friend. No matter how trapped you feel in your circumstances, God can minister to your deepest need. Jesus said to the man that day, and I believe that he says to us today, do you want to be well? Do you want to be happy again? Listen to me. Some of us are walking in some grief, and we're not walking in it well. We're allowing the grief to overwhelm us and to control us. And listen to me. It's okay to be happy again. Your loss does not mean that you have to be a prisoner to your grief. I'm going to speak to that more in just a moment. But I want you to hear a real life story. Now, many of you know, some of you may not, this was my wife, Trisha. And so I've asked her to just share out of her own personal walk in this very specific situation. So my mom was sick for a very long time before she died in 2014. And during her last months, I would wake up night after night, praying and begging God to heal her. And quite honestly wondering why the healer wasn't healing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until one night, I woke up, started to beg again, and he stopped me. And I felt the heaviness of his presence on me, like his hand was covering me and calming me with his peace. And he reminded me of the time he was with Martha after her brother Lazarus had died. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And in that moment, the Lord was telling me hard truth. My mom wasn't dying, but her body was. And now it was the time for me to turn to him, the God of all hope, and praise him and welcome him into my pain and my loss as he welcomed her and in that moment it was just Jesus and me it was go time did I really believe him did I really believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life was my hope really in him would I trust him in the hardest time and when I said yes when I turned to him in praise and welcomed Jesus into my sorrow just like that day at Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept. He wept right there with me. Because death is hard. And I mourned. But Jesus is hope. And my resurrected King Jesus, he put his hope right smack dab in the middle of my pain. And he bore it. He bore it. And he gave me the peace of his presence. He gave me assurance. He gave me joy. He gave me hope. God would not let grief swallow me. And he helped me to see life again. Your loss does not mean that you have to be a prisoner to your grief. You can, you must live and laugh and love again. Grieving without hope is a sin. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Now stick with me because in, in your thinking you may miss what I say. 
Grieving without hope is a sin because it's in direct disobedience to what we are commanded to do. Paul's admonition in the text there is is that there is a better way to grieve. He contrasts bad grieving of no hope with good grieving that is hope-filled. Paul's admonition is not to not grieve, but to grieve in a good way. To grieve in hope. To grieve in light of God's goodness and love and mercy and truth and faithfulness. You may hear it say that there's no wrong way to grieve. It's not accurate. It's just not true. No matter how well-intentioned it may be. Those who believe in the resurrection of Jesus are called to grieve in ways that make much of Jesus, our glorious Savior, who died and rose and is coming again. Despair wallows in the if-onlys and the what-ifs. But faith dwells in the blood-bought reality that God will strengthen us to live with hope. Hopeless grief says, I have lost the only thing that makes life worth living. But a hopeful grief magnifies the surpassing worth of God and says that nothing in all the earth can separate me from Christ. Hopeful grief is still grief. God does not gloss over our grief. As Trisha shared, when Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, those were not fake tears. Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, yet he still he wept over death and loss. The hope of resurrection doesn't eliminate tears, but it does redeem them. Suffering well is not an indifference to pain, but a holding fast to Jesus. Knowing and worshiping Jesus, even in the midst of loss, become the energizing force that keeps us going. As Charles Spurgeon once wrote, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. We're the lame man in the story. I'd like to say that my hope is always in Jesus. The truth is, though, I've got just enough resources that I don't always have to trust God. Sometimes I've got just enough money to cover the cost. Sometimes I've got enough contacts to make phone calls to help me out. Sometimes I got enough street smarts and common sense to just deal with the challenge in front of me. So while I'd like to say that my hope is always in Jesus, many times my hope is is in what I have and what I have the ability to do. The point is this. In the first coming of the Son of God into the world, we received a foretaste of his healing power. Jesus healed one man out of thousands. We receive a foretaste of what eternity will provide. The full healing of all God's people and all our diseases and disabilities awaits the second coming of Christ. And the aim of these foretastes that we receive now is to call us to hope and trust in God through faith in Jesus. In verse 14, Jesus finds the man in the the crowd, right? In verse 14, it says that after this, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. What could possibly be worse than being paralyzed and lame for 38 years? What could possibly be worse than being relegated to a beggar in the culture? What could possibly be worse than being isolated away from people and from a sense of hope? Though 38 years of physical sickness had taken the best years of his life away, an unrepentant, sinful heart would take away his eternity. There is something worse than suffering in this world, an eternity apart from God without Jesus. So we sing this Christmas, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her King. My friends, hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Just say that name with me, Jesus. Just say it out loud. Jesus. 
We used to sing a little chorus. I learned this one going to church with my grandparents. They sang the cool hymns at their church. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. For kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Jesus, hope is a reality, and hope has a name. For hope was born that first Christmas morn, and hope was nailed to a cross in mine and your place, and hope was buried in a borrowed tomb, and hope raised in victory over death, hell, sin, and the grave. And hope provides us the strength day by day, and hope is coming again one day to redeem all of this and to make it all right before eternity. We're going to stand and sing about this hope who is Jesus. I'm going to be standing right here at the front. If you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior and you realize today that the need of your life is to surrender and trust Christ, I plead with you while we sing, you step out and would come. Maybe something is said today. That's the situation. That's the attitude. That's the hurt. That's the place where brokenness is impacting my life. And I need to surrender that to Jesus. Do it at your seat, kneel at an altar, but whatever, let us respond in a surrendered faith to God today. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we praise you. We praise you that you are God and that into time and space you sent your Son. Father, thank you for the testimony of your word, for the testimony of your child. And Father, thank you for this moment to respond to you.